and welcome to Human Stories. My name is Letha Victor, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I'm an anthropologist and an ethnographer, and for the last dozen years or so, my interests have been centered around life and death in the East African country of Uganda, which you see here colored in red on this map. Today, I'm going to tell you a story about Uganda that comes from the north of the country in this red circle here near the border with South Sudan. Today's story is both human and no longer human, or perhaps we could call it after human or even never was human, but something else entirely. So what on earth does that mean? I'm here to talk to you about ghosts, ancestors, and other non-human spirits, and to muse about what their haunting manifestations might mean for us humans, no matter where we come from. In many places across the world today, such forces are not a matter of belief or disbelief, but are simply part and parcel of life. The question is not always, are ghosts real, but rather, what are ghosts and how should we respond to haunting? What this means is that if you've come to this video hoping for me to scientifically prove or disprove the existence of spooky things, I'm sorry to say that you will leave disappointed. So rather than ghost busting, instead I'm going to tell you stories that are always mediated through human tellings. My own research about these human spirit relations takes place in the Acholi subregion of Northern Uganda, where a series of large and small scale conflicts occurred over different periods in the last half of the 20th, 20th century and into the 21st. When I say that this recent history of war partially impacts life today, including the problem of haunting, that's because there are a great number of other things that shape and are shaped by ordinary life in Uganda today. These include global economic policies, the legacy of British colonialism, over a century and a half of religious and medical pluralism, and other factors really too numerous to mention here. Nonetheless, when outsiders, and we'll soon find out insiders, speak about Northern Uganda, there is one word that tends to crop up over and over again. That is the English word trauma. In the early 2000s, an international community of humanitarians, activists, and non-governmental organizations formed a critical mass that began to sound an alarm about Northern Uganda, where immense human suffering was then resulting from an escalation in war between Ugandan government forces and the group now called the Lord's Resistance Army or LRA. As stories of war crimes and crimes against humanity began to circulate to a global public, it became common to equate stories of Ugandan ghosts with psychological trauma. But as we'll see, the picture is a bit more complex. So without further ado, let me tell you a brief story. Around the time of Easter in 2014, I was in a rural area of a choli called Atiak. Easter time in Atiak is significant for two reasons. One, because the overwhelming majority of his residents are practicing Roman Catholics, Anglicans, or born-again Christians. And so the celebrated resurrection of Jesus Christ marks a powerful day. But it's also a time of year associated with grievous death rather than resurrection. Because in April of 1995, a rebel commander from their own area spearheaded the massacre of about 300 people whose bodies fell on the grassy banks of a nearby river. Many of the victims were students from the area's vocational school, and these young men were not all from the Atiak area or even Acholi. As survivors fled the area and there still remained a significant chance of violence, people scrambled to bury the dead. In Acholi, as in many places in the world, the custom is to bury the dead at home with a considerable amount of care and ritual so that the tipu of the dead, meaning shadows or souls, can be at peace and eventually become ancestor spirits. But many people, especially those from outside the Atiak area, were unable to recover the bodies of their loved ones and afford them, afford them proper burial rites. At the time, the vast majority of people in Acholi were fo forced to live in insecure, internally displaced persons camps, and they did not have freedom of movement. Many could not access their home areas in order to farm or bury their dead. And others could not access the area where the murder victims fell, which, will, which you see pictured here. And so a shallow mass grave was hastily dug by the river. Fast forward 19 years where life in Acholi had improved considerably 
and there was no longer active war in northern Uganda. The picture you see here is of a drum being warmed by a fire so that, could be, it, could, so that it could be played as part of initial burial rites for my friend's grandmother, who had peacefully died of old age at home. So for the last dozen years or so, people have now been able to live in their home areas and reconstruct their communities. But this reconstruction involves more than just bricks and mortar. It also involves the repairing and active maintenance of relationships. These relationships extend into the land of the dead and to the land of the non-human spirits. But it's not this drum in this picture that I want to talk about right now. It's not the drum of a good death, but a ghostly drum that was heard that Easter of 2014 in Atiyak. A survivor of the massacre told me a story that was circulating, that a hunter or a group of hunters had recently been on the land near the massacre site and they had heard the ghostly sounds of, a de of deceased young men playing, singing, and dancing a famous royal Acholi dance called the Bola. This was not the first nor the last ghostly happening in the area. About a dozen years after the massacre, a man I will call Tony went out into the bushes to cut firewood. Tony's brother told me what happened. When he came home, Tony was tormented by dirty things meaning bad phenomena that are difficult to identify. This brother of mine says that when dirty things come, they talk to him. Tony began to see people hanging from the trees and, people said, and those people said to him, why did you cut me? Tony told his brother that there are many bodies there that are invisible to the, human, the living human eye. Some members of the family encouraged Tony to become a Christian. When he's very deep in the born again faith, he's okay, says his brother. But if he backslides, he begins to drink alcohol and the problem starts again. The so-called dirty thing that Tony sees is often identified as something called Chen. There are other types of dirty things and other types of spirits that are not regarded as malevolent, but Chen is a haunting force that is especially known by Acholi people as creating havoc in people's lives. While born again Christians especially equate Chen with Satan or demons, for others Chen means ghostly vengeance, the rage of human spirits who died painful deaths or deaths away from home or whose dead bodies were not treated with adequate ritual care. While this means that someone who killed another person might be haunted by Chen, it also means that someone who witnessed a death or accidentally encountered human remains and failed to treat them properly may be attacked by Chen. But Chen is not an equal opportunity ghost. People often say that it is people who are especially fearful who attract the attention of ghostly vengeance. Even more importantly, Chen is a problem that is contagious. This means that the haunting can be passed from person to person or even lie dormant and attack the children or grandchildren of the person who originally witnessed, caused, or was otherwise materially connected to the bad death. Chen, if left untreated by ritual interventions, can lead to madness, physical illness, and death. Those people and their families who are suspected of having Chen may become socially isolated because of the fear of transmission. Chen, it seems, affects women and especially children more than anyone. At this primary, primary school, for instance, a rash of suspected spirit possessions has provoked many different theories as to their cause, and Chen is just one of them. But another dominant interpretation is that these symptoms of Chen are in fact the result of psychological trauma. These screenshots here are just a tiny sample of the literature on trauma in Northern Uganda that has proliferated from both inside and outside of the country. What is really going on, the collective narrative goes, is that Northern Ugandans are psychologically wounded and that talk of ghosts and demons and spirits is idiomatic or a metaphorical representation of clinical problems. For some Ugandans, like many trained in the National Psychiatric Hospital of Budapika near the capital Kampala, spirits and modern psychiatry are incompatible. Here we see the modest mental health unit at Gulu Referral Hospital, which is the only unit, which is the only unit of its kind in Acholi. I don't have time today to talk about these clinicians who are fascinating people in and of themselves. 
will leave behind the clinical evaluations of trauma and, and instead look to ordinary people outside of the clinic who are now grappling with that with what is actually a new concept, trauma. My friend Laniero told me what trauma means to her. During the war, when things were difficult and most people were living in the camps, such as the one seen here, NGOs like Save the Children, World Vision, Norwegian Refugee Council, and Caritas sensitized, sensitized the residents about how they should manage themselves. And people first began to hear this, this word used in English, trauma. The NGOs taught women not to go topless, Laniero said, and told them to wear shoes and instructed them on proper hygiene. But girls these days, Laniero continued, are getting spoiled. The young men are all bodas, meaning motorcycle taxi drivers, and are hardly marriage material. They're not managing themselves. Girls are going to see witch doctors because they have the trauma of not being able to live properly, she lamented. While she professes a love for traditional medicine and praises its efficacy, like many of her compatriots, she differentiates between herbal remedies and what she regards as the evil magic of witchcraft. Girls are watching Nigerian movies, she argued, and they're giving people the wrong idea that if they go for witchcraft, they can get a good man. The trauma of not being able to live properly is causing this, she said. Conversing in English, when I asked Laniero what she meant when she said people have trauma, her explanation was a circular one that I heard repeated often, that trauma means to be traumatized. The more I spoke to ordinary Acholi people outside of the clinic about this English word trauma, the more I heard different definitions about what it means. For some, it equates to the suffering of a difficult life. For others, it's something to do with bad memories. And for others, it's a pathology or dis of disruptive flashbacks and mental disorganization caused by bad experiences. But there is one thing that nearly everyone agreed upon. Trauma, they said, is not the same thing as the haunting of Chen. Unlike Chen, which is an outside force that can attack for generations and impact an entire family, Trauma comes from inside one person's mind and from their individual experience alone. Though I've not had the time today to talk to you all about the different ways that people respond to the problem of dirty things like Chen, let me put it together and talk about some of the main findings that we can sum up here. One of the most important things to understand is that dealing with the problem of haunting or suspected haunting means confronting the past with the intent to repair broken relationships or to soothe distressed beings, whether they're living or dead. Because spirits are tied to collective and not just individual histories, this means that we can only understand why people respond the way they do by considering ongoing social changes and new considerations as they crop up over time. There's no magic bullet or ritual that rids the world of haunting. The second main finding of this work is that in vernacular understandings of trauma in Acholi, its meaning is also diverse, but it's widely understood to be a, not a collective wound, but an individual one. Finally, while there is a relationship between Chen and trauma, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. People have explained to me that psychological trauma or the psychological problem of trauma can make one vulnerable to haunting or to possession by malevolent spirits, but it's not the haunting itself. While Chen is a collective problem that comes from outside forces that are especially attuned to gendered and age-based ideas of susceptibility, trauma, they say, can get anyone. In some ways, it's a democratized form of suffering as well as memory. In the English language today, or perhaps more widely in the global north, it's common to talk about the unrepaired wounds of history and to speak of ghost stories as allegories for the truth that is trauma. What these stories from Northern Uganda tell us is that haunting is not just a metaphor or a story told about around a campfire. Rather, it's a tangible reality for many people in the world for whom unseen forces coexist with biomedicine and modern psychology. 
This implies then that scientific or psychological language is just as idiomatic as so-called religious or spiritual language. If we rethink the dominance that science has as a gateway to the capital T truth, we start to see the ways in which it also operates on shifting cultural conceptions, such as a wound to the mind or the soul. This doesn't mean that science isn't real, and that, nor does it mean that there is some sort of authentic way to, to experience or talk about suffering. What it does mean is that humans are creative and adaptive, no matter where they are or when they are. They take new ideas and fashion them into narratives that reflect present, but always sh shifting life circumstances. Thanks for watching and be sure to check back soon for more human stories. Peace and light to you and yours. So I, I you know, I sometimes do this and do